Thanks very much, Colleen, and uh, good morning, everyone. I feel quite at home here. Just in the uh, last week or so, I've been diagnosed with osteoarthritis, and it's really only just come on me in the last uh, couple of months, the aches and pains and so forth. And had an MRI yesterday, so when I walked into this room uh, about an hour ago and people were talking about all sorts of things, I thought, well, I'm at home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can stagger along and, and people won't, uh, uh, won't think less of me. And uh, that might be just a little loud, is it? Is that too loud or you can hear me? Okay. Um, I titled this talk, uh, Meditation and Aid to Healing. And what I mean by that is when you are in the present moment, and of course that's almost impossible to do, but it's something that we strive to do, when you're in the present moment, you are being healed. It is the thing that heals you. And that's our goal in meditation and mindfulness, to be in the now, to be in the present moment. That's the only goal that we're looking for. So we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, over the next hour or so. Um, I'd like you to close your eyes, please. Just close your eyes and be as relaxed as you possibly can. I don't want you to fold your arms if you can, uh, or to have your hands clasped like that. Just have your hands gently in your lap. And I want you to bring yourself into the present moment, into the now. I don't want you to think about earlier this morning or even five minutes ago or the muffin that you've just had or what you're going to have for lunch, or where you're going later on today, I want you to be in the now. So for just a moment, just be in the present moment. Okay. Most of us find that a very difficult task to be in the present moment. Uh, the average time for meditation is around about 20 minutes. People seem to find that is a, a time that uh, gives them a certain amount of satisfaction from their meditation practice. But of course you can meditate for one, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, up to an hour if you want to. But most people find that a 20 minute period is the ideal period. You've probably heard people talk a lot about mindfulness. It seems to be the in thing at the moment. Mindfulness, of course, is thousands and thousands of years old. Mindfulness is really the exterior act of meditation. Meditation is an interior thing. So when I meditate, for example, if I meditate in the morning and I meditate at night, they become the bookends of my day. And as the bookends of my day, I go into myself. It becomes an interior practice. And I concentrate on my breath. So what I try and do is rid my mind of all sorts of thoughts. It ain't easy. It's really difficult. And sometimes, in a 20-minute meditation period, I might go 19 and a half minutes where I've thought of, oh, what am I getting at Woolworths? Uh, you know, I'm going on holidays next week, that'll be great. But for half a minute, I might just empty my mind. There's an expression, and it's that uh, sometimes your mind is a monkey mind. That is, that it's like a tree full of monkeys. It is very difficult to empty our minds, but meditation is not what you think. In fact, I saw a very nice T-shirt once which had written on it, meditation is not what you think. And that's our goal. That is our goal. Our goal is to really rid our mind of thoughts and to be in the present moment because when we're in the present moment, it takes away our anxiety, it takes away depression. And again, I say it's not easy, but it's a goal worth pursuing. With mindfulness, you can do mindfulness anywhere. If you are walking up uh, this particular street here and you decided to be mindful, you might decide to concentrate on the colours of the buildings. But you wouldn't concentrate to the point of where you walk out in front of traffic. If you were meditating, you probably would. But with mindfulness, 
Mindfulness is concentrating on something in the present moment, but it's something that you can do anywhere. And when I teach people about meditation and mindfulness, I say the two are like their hand in glove. Because um, I suggest to people that they do a little bit of meditation in the morning, a little bit at night, and then during the day, think of a whole lot of mindfulness exercises. And one mindfulness exercise might be a simple one, preparing breakfast, where you have your Wheaties and you pour them into a bowl and you concentrate on what you're doing. Most of the time we don't. Most of the time we, we pour Wheaties into a bowl and we get our milk and we get our sugar and we do all those sorts of things. But we don't really think about precisely what we're doing at that time. Being present to what we're doing is really important for acts of mindfulness. And you know, mindfulness can bring you great joy. Um, I read a couple of years ago about a man, actually a neurologist, at, uh, at one of the universities in Tokyo, and uh, quite a famous teacher there in medicine. And he decided to become a Zen Buddhist monk in the strictest Zen order in Japan. And when he went to see the abbot, the abbot said, well, he said, I don't want you to read a book for a year. Here's a man that's uh, been a bookish man all of his life, was an academic. <coughs> don't read a book for a year, and I want you, your task is just to polish the floorboards. And that's all you have to do for the whole year. Yeah. And that's what he did. The lesson there is detachment, to be detached and also to learn about being in the present moment. He's now back at Tokyo University. He's back in one of the hospitals there and he's probably a much better practitioner because of the experience in the Zen Buddhist monastery. He's still a Zen Buddhist monk, I, I might add, but as well as that, he practices as a neurologist. Now, of course, we can't do that. We don't have... Uh, that opportunity to go away to monasteries and to learn all that kind of thing. But we can do simple exercises. And those simple exercises throughout the day, one of the things that my wife always encourages me to do is, why don't you do a mindfulness exercise in vacuuming the floor? <laughs> <laughs> or washing the dishes. <laughs> or you know how I wash the clothes all the time. Hey, here's a good mindfulness exercise for you, Peter. And they are. Even the most menial task, it might be cleaning the toilet, can become an exercise of joy. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. It becomes an exercise of joy when it is done in the moment. Now, of course, when you're doing something in the moment, you start off, I'm washing this cup. And then all of a sudden, you're out of the moment. You start thinking about something else. <gasps> My daughter, where's she gone? She's not in the room here. <gasps> I have to come back to the moment. So you have to, as soon as you're aware that you're away from the present moment, you have to bring yourself back to the present moment. And that's the same with meditation. When you're meditating, you always bring yourself back to the present moment. Now, because you people have a condition, a disease, you call it a disease, do you? A condition, okay. There are difficulties, I, I presume, in concentration. I know that a meditation group that I run, I often get people coming who have things like acute anxiety. And it is very hard, very, very difficult, because when you suffer from acute anxiety or depression, it is not easy to meditate. So I often suggest the simplest thing, find your own way. My mother, uh, when she was dying, she was staying at my sister's place. And she said to me, son, can you teach me to meditate? And I said, oh, golly. How am I going to do this? She's in terrible pain. And... Um, you know, it was the end part of her life. And I thought the very, the simplest thing that I can get mum to do 
is to stare at a candle. She was short-sighted, so that helped, because if she takes the glasses off and puts the candle down where the projector is there, it means the candle is just a blob, a nice golden blob. My sister rang me a couple of days later. She was staying at my sister's, and she said, whatever did you tell Mum? Because we're getting through a lot of candles. <laughs> And when I come out at two o'clock in the morning, here she is, <laughs> she's meditating. It was my turn to take her next to the Peter McCallum Clinic, to the oncologist, and we were no sooner through the door of the surgery and she said to the oncologist, I'm a meditator now. <laughs> he said, oh yeah. <laughs> but we won't go into that. So meditation is that very intensive exercise that one does. And whether you do it for two, three minutes, 20 minutes, usually a couple of times a day is the ideal. And mindfulness are acts that you do right throughout the day. And you can be mindful with anything. And my experience is that whenever I'm stressed, whenever I'm anxious, or even if I'm feeling a bit low, and it's interesting, uh, you'd all know the drug endone. Yeah, of course you do. Um, well, the doctor put me on this endone because of the pain of this. And what my experience is that it fixes me for a while and then it makes me feel awful. I just feel down. But what I tried yesterday is, as I was sort of coming out of that cycle with endone, I thought, no, this is the perfect opportunity for me to be mindful. So I just found opportunities in the house to do different things to be absolutely present to what I was doing. And it works. And I found that on so many occasions that whenever I'm feeling a bit anxious, a bit stressed, a bit low, if you like, it doesn't have to be clinical depression or clinical anxiety, if I put my mind to being in the present moment, to doing mindfulness acts, because sometimes I'm just not up to meditation because I might be in too much pain, then it works very well for me. My wife is also a meditator and she often says that, um, well, for example, if you get a bad cold, she would say, or a flu, something like that, she says, go to your place of meditation, irrespective of whether you can meditate or not. Because I recommend to people that if they're going to meditate, that they choose somewhere in their house or their apartment and make that a special place. And sometimes you can ritualise the whole thing and it might be with a candle. Most people like candles. It might be a nice cloth. It might be a little vase of flowers. It could be anything. You don't have to do any of these things. You can meditate on Flinders Street Station or anywhere for that matter. But a lot of people like to have a special place within their house where they go for meditation. Some people even like to put a shawl around there and, and all of these things are to ritualise the acts. And why do we ritualise? We ritualise to remind ourselves of the importance of what we're doing. To reinforce in our mind the importance of what it's all about. That we've come to our place of meditation. And even if you're unwell, even if you're in chronic pain and you can't meditate, it may be that you can pick up a little book or something, of poems or something, and just latch on to something. The fact that you're there in your place of meditation, the intention will help you. Posture is important in meditation, but all of us here, and me at the moment too, I have a lot of trouble. But the important thing is, if you can, just to keep your back straight. You don't have to sit in the lotus. I, look, I, if I sat in the lotus position, I'd never get up. <laughs> Let alone a half lotus or a quarter lotus or anything else. And in my experience, most people in the West can't. And, um, but uh, the reason that people do sit in the lotus position is because it, it straightens their spine right up here and that helps with uh, concentration. So if you, can, if you can sit up straight in a chair then that's the recommendation because it will help you with your, your level of concentration. 
And that's really all you need to do. Don't cross your legs, don't fold your arms, but be as relaxed as you can, but not to the point of where you're in your Jason recliner and where you're going to fall asleep. I mean, if you do fall asleep, don't feel guilty about it because the thing about meditation is that you should never feel guilty. And you can't fail. There's no such thing as failure. Even if you find yourself uh, setting out to meditate for 20 minutes and you might, say, have 30 seconds of where you feel you've got a certain amount of calm or bliss, it doesn't mean that the rest of the time is wasted, no. The fact that you've gone to meditation and that you're doing your meditation is sufficient. You know, in certain uh, Buddhist circles, they call meditation practice. They don't call it meditation, they call it practice. And the reason is that it's all about practice. It's about going back time and time and time and time again and practicing meditation. Wisdom is to fall in love with questions. I'll say that again. Wisdom is to fall in love with questions. Knowledge is to fall in love with answers. Knowledge is to fall in love with answers. Now, both of those things are important. But when we talk about meditation and mindfulness, we are, in a sense, talking about wisdom. I'll tell you a story. Uh, I used to do a lot of work for the ABC and I made a documentary about the Dalai Lama. I've made three documentaries with the Dalai Lama, very fortunate. And he's had a profound impact on my life. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Buddhist. But I have gained a great deal, particularly from a man like him. I spent a bit of time with him and I decided that after being with him in the north of India, that I would go back to Melbourne via Tokyo to see a man called William Johnson, who is an Irishman, uh, a Jesuit Catholic priest. He's dead now. But Bill had spent most of his time in Japan teaching at Sophia University. But was a great friend of the Dalai Lama's and had written many, many books on mysticism and meditation and so forth. And I wanted to get his opinion of the Dalai Lama. I wanted to get a different perspective. When I arrived at the Jesuit house, he was next door at the Zen Buddhist monastery and I was told that he's never at the Jesuit house, he's always next door, meditating. He was retired at this stage. But he said a very interesting thing to me. He said, in the West, if I say to somebody, I want to learn to meditate, they say, okay, well, here's a book. Go away and learn it. And then I come back and I say, well, I've read that book. It's really interesting, you know, that's great. And then I say, okay, well, here's another book. Go away and learn that. If I was to go and ask the Dalai Lama about meditation, he would say, just try five minutes here. In other words, he would be about practice, not about learning from books. Now, I don't want to be anti-intellectual. I have got bookshelves full of books about meditation and mindfulness. But the fact is that it's about practice, 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 practice. It's about doing it. That's what meditation is. I know a lot of people who are extremely knowledgeable about meditation, but they ain't practitioners. They're not practitioners. In fact, sadly, I just learnt the other day of a hospital here in Melbourne that had just started courses in mindfulness. And I thought, that's terrific. Great, a lot of them do for their staff. This particular hospital, though, I found out, the person that was going to give the course had never meditated and had never done any mindfulness, but had read a couple of books and was going to run courses. Now, this is rather sad because we are talking about something that is about practice. It's really important to practice. There are thousands of ways of meditating. I teach one and that's generally to empty the mind. That's the hardest of all. But you have to find your own way. It's up to you. Some people, I think somebody mentioned here before, it might have been Colin, I'm not sure, if you listen to music. Is, was you talking about that? Somebody was anyway, listening to music. 
Yes, that's a nice thing to do. That's a nice thing to do. Other people um, like to look at uh, a picture or as they would call it, a mandala. Other people recite things. We call them mantras. The most well-known mantra in the whole of the world would be just the word Om. In Buddhist circles, it would be Omni Mani Padmi Hum, which means I am in the eye of the lotus. And you know the lotus, the lotus, if you've ever been to parts of Asia where lotuses grow wild. I remember in a, a slum in Delhi seeing lotuses grow in a, a pond which was virtually a sewerage settling pond. So you have the beauty of the lotus flower in the midst of sewage. It's very symbolic very, very symbolic for us. But you don't have to do any of that. You find your own way. It might be as simple as a candle, looking at a candle just for a couple of minutes. And I remember going to a conference and it was a conference for um, people working in hospitals in, in this particular area, mainly in, in pastoral work in hospitals. And there was a chaplain and he was from the United States and he said the most popular channel and, you know, in hospital these days you can get Foxtel and all sorts of stuff. He said, apart from the football, <laughs> football always wins, but apart from the football, the most watched channel was simply a camera on a candle. And it was watched mainly in the middle of the night by patients who just couldn't sleep. So they'd put it onto whatever channel it was, that's channel 40 or something, and they just watch the candle burning. Find your own way. There's no right way, there's no wrong way. But I do recommend very strongly to you that you find a way of being in the moment. Being in the present moment. Because that is our objective. There's no other objective. You will find that it will bring you peace of mind. It brings control into your life. When I'm speaking to mainly men, although increasingly women these days, um, occasionally I've been asked to do corporate things and a lot of men are very worried that it's going to take away their sense of competition and ambition. I understand that. It doesn't, of course. It doesn't. It makes you more considerate, I would hope. One of the nice things about meditation is if you surround it with a whole lot of other rituals and some of my teachers have always said to surround it with gratitude even when you don't feel very grateful. And what I mean by that is that at night, for example, when I meditate, I try and think of something that I'm grateful for during the day. Now yesterday, if you'll pardon the French, I had a shit of a day. <laughs> I did. I had an MRI and I had all sorts of tests and all sorts of things and I was feeling pretty poorly. So last night when I sat down, I thought, what am I grateful for? Well, I was actually grateful for my wife cooked a very nice meal. So I was grateful for that. I have a daughter in Sydney and I remember visiting her once a few years ago and she made us all hold hands around the table and I said, they're going to say a prayer, but they didn't. What they did is the kids had to think of something that they were grateful for during the day. And of course, kids being kids, you know, oh, terrible day. No, my daughter Bridget would say, come on, you've got to think of something grateful. So it would be something like, I was first on the bus. <laughs> you know, or something, you know, try and think of something. But if you bring things like gratitude, there's a wonderful website, www.gratefulness.com, which is all about that. If you bring a thing like gratefulness into your meditation practice, it will really help you to have a, a very positive spin on meditation and mindfulness. 
I can just keep talking about meditation, but I think what we might do is a relaxation exercise. You probably feel like that. Too. Right. So we might do a relaxation exercise and just sort of a body scan. Is that okay, everybody? Yeah, right. And I'm going to sit down for this. Um, that was on. I'll do it again. No, he's obviously turned it down. <laughs> Did you? Is it when I sit down? Let's see what happens. Yeah, I know it's a bit feedback here. Yeah. Okay, what I want you to do is to close your eyes. I want you to just make sure that your feet are just lightly touching the ground, not digging into the carpet. And I want you to just check in with your body. Notice how it feels. Let the weight of your body soften a little more. Just be in the present moment. Clear your mind and establish your focus. You might even like to say to yourself, just silently, just to yourself, this is a time for healing, a time I give to myself for healing. I want my life to be meaningful. I want my life to be purposeful. Now I want you to take three or four deep breaths in through the nostrils and out through the mouth. So breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. and let your breath return to its easy natural rhythm, <coughs> breathing through the nostrils if you can. Now take your attention down to your feet. Notice how your feet are feeling today. Notice as much as you can about your feet and ankles. And if you can, just try and wriggle your feet a little bit. Just wriggle them on the floor, if you can. Make the movements conscious and slow. And then take a big in-breath and then on the out breath, just bring your feet softly onto the floor again and stop wriggling them. And relax. Then gently move your attention up into the calves and notice how they're feeling or any contact with clothing. Now with your attention on your calves, flex and release them a few times, just the muscles in your calves, just flex and release them. Tightening them up and releasing. Tightening them up and releasing. And as you let go that flexing and releasing, feel the letting go, soft and relaxed all through the calves, soft and relaxed. Now bring your attention up into your thighs, noticing the contact that you have with the chair. 
These are the, the longest muscles in our body. Then gently flex and release your thigh muscles a few times, attending to the feeling of flexing and releasing. Tighten up those thigh muscles and release them. Tighten them up and then releasing. And if you can do that with an in and out breath, that's the ideal. Now move your attention to your belly and your lower back. Notice how your belly feels. Notice any constriction that you might have from elastic or a belt. Notice any contact with clothing. Feel how your belly rises and falls with your breath. And notice how that rising and falling of your breath flows into the muscles of the lower back as well. Be present to the feelings in your belly and your lower back. And be aware of the organs and the viscera of your body inside the belly rising and falling. And just hold your belly tight, those muscles of the belly. And on an out breath, just relax and let it all go. Do that a few times, breathing in, tighten the muscles of your belly and on the out breath, just let it all go. Now move your attention to the spine and the back. Feel the erect upthrust of the spine. Feel the subtle movements in the back as it flexes with each breath. The shoulder blades rising and falling with each breath. Keep your eyes closed and you might like to just move your shoulder blades around. Just introduce some small, gentle movements into the back, slowly. Maybe you'd even like to sway from side to side. Just something there to remind you of the importance of those muscles that you find in your shoulders. Next, let your attention come to your chest. Feel the rising and the falling of the ribs, the movement of the life breath in your body. Feel the strength of the rib cage, the effortless rhythm of the breath and the heartbeat in your body. These great natural rhythms of your body rising and falling. Now take a sequence of slow deep breaths. Feel the fullness of these breaths. Feel how the lungs inside the body push out against the rib cage and down into the diaphragm.
Now after releasing the final deep breath, allow your breathing to return to its own natural rhythm. Now bring your attention to your neck and your throat, all the muscles and the blood vessels, the cervical spine, the esophagus, the trachea, connecting the head and the body. Sometimes there's a stiffness or soreness in the neck. Become more aware of your neck and throat. And just slowly move your head about. Perhaps slowly sway your head from side to side. Maybe from front to back. Keeping all the movements slow and conscious. Everybody's got their eyes closed so nobody can see what you're doing. Now bring your awareness to your face. Feel the hinge of the jaw below your ears, the point of your jaw, how your lips are touching. Notice the feeling of the skin across your cheeks and temples. How your eyelids are touching. And be aware of the myriad of tiny muscles in the face that constantly register emotions and thoughts and feelings and reactions. Now just take a few moments to move your jaw about. And again, everybody's eyes are closed, so just move your jaw about. And in those movements, soften the mouth as well, the lips sliding against each other slightly. Now be aware of your scalp. Allow the forehead to become softer and smoother. All the muscles across the forehead and through the eyebrows, long and soft and relaxed. And feel the sense of relaxation through your entire body now, easy and relaxed and simply rest in it now, relaxed in the body and in the mind. Feeling this relaxation in the present moment, all through relaxing and letting go. You don't have to do anything. Just rest in it now, all through effortlessly calm and relaxed. And when you're ready, just open your eyes. Often with uh, groups of people, we do that exercise on the floor. Um, and it's amazing the number of people who fall asleep. Uh, that's about half the exercise, I should add. Uh, we don't have time to do the, uh, what I call the full body scan. <laughs> uh, the full body scan, uh, a lot of people do fall asleep and that's, that's just fine. 
that's, that's just fine. I've mentioned before about the uh, distinction between meditation and mindfulness. Sometimes it's only semantic, doesn't matter too much, but I'll just give you an example. Uh, some years ago, I was at a place in um, France. Uh, there's a very famous meditation teacher called Thich Nhat Hanh. Some of you may have heard of him. Thich Nhat Hanh is a Vietnamese teacher. Uh, he, during the Vietnam War, he was a peace activist. Uh, he started universities and schools and all sorts of things in Vietnam. He tried to bring the, the North uh, together with the South. Of course, they hated each other, so that was an impossibility, but he tried. He went over to the United States to meet with peace activists during the Vietnam War. He met with people such as Martin Luther King and many other peace activists at the time and they wouldn't allow him back into Vietnam. And in fact, he's only been allowed back into Vietnam in recent years. Um, he went to France, where a lot of Vietnamese went, and he opened a monastery in the south of France, and it's a place called um, uh, Plum Village. It's in a lovely part of France, in Bordeaux, and um, surrounded by vineyards, but you can't drink wine at their place, <laughs> but you're surrounded by vineyards. And uh, he has about a hundred monks there and about a hundred nuns. And people come from all over the world. People of, who are interested in religion and people who have no religion. It doesn't matter. We're talking about meditation. We're talking about mindfulness. But one of the exercises that they gave us to do in the afternoon was a little bit of manual work. Most of the time it was meditation. And a lot of meditation, I can tell you a lot of meditation. And right throughout the day at Plum Village, you would hear this. Bells going all day. All day. And every time we heard a bell, we had to take three deep breaths. And I found myself all day, from early in morning when you got up at half past four, right through until you went to bed about nine o'clock at night, we'd hear bells and we'd have to stop and the whole idea is to be mindful, to remind yourself to be mindful. But in the afternoon, we had one hour of manual work. Freezing cold, middle of winter. Sort of like ice in the air. Oh, you Brisbane people wouldn't know what that is, but <laughs> everybody else does. <laughs> you can imagine it, though, can't you? Yes, you can. Um, but ice in the air. And they gave me the task of mo moving a rose bush from here over to here. The soil was clay, so I started digging and digging and digging and digging and I was having a terrible time, really. And this Zen Buddhist nun came over and tapped me on the shoulder and she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm about to move the rose bush as I was instructed to do. And she said, in your mind, you've already moved the rose bush. You're not being mindful. And I had. So many tasks that we do, and I'll return to one that's familiar to some of you, I'm sure, things like vacuuming the floor. If I start off with the attitude that I want to finish this as quickly as possible because it's a task I dislike intensely, then that's the wrong attitude. So what she was saying to me, you be mindful to this and it will become a thing of joy. And I was mindful. I did move the rose bush, I might say. I moved it quite successfully. But I had to be mindful to moving the rose bush. There's a very famous street here in Melbourne uh, called Hoddle Street or Punt Road. And it's one of our busiest thoroughfares. And on a Friday night in wintertime when it's dark and it may be even raining, and cars are not moving, you know, it's bumper to bumper, you just can't move. And, and you're half an hour late for an appointment. What can you do? Well, Thich Nhat Hanh would say, you can't do anything. You simply can't do anything. And what he would recommend is that you concentrate on the red lights, the stop lights on the car in front of you, as a point of concentration. Now, you don't meditate on them, otherwise you crash into the car. 
but you can use them as a point of mindfulness. And it's amazing just how that can relax you. I've tried it out and it does work because you can't do anything. You're stuck. And if your battery's flat on your phone, providing, of course, you've got hands-free, providing you've got hands-free, uh, there's nothing you can do. So, but you can take away that anxiety by a simple mindfulness act. Now, I see we're running out of time. Have we got any time for questions, Colin? We're close to the time. What, what would you like to do? I'm, I'm easy. Two questions, okay. Thank you. Peter, that's really, really intriguing what you've been talking about. Thank you. I usually get the job of vacuuming. <laughs> <coughs> I'm wondering we, if... We can compare notes later. <laughs> I'm very, very good at it. Oh, um, on, I'm wondering, does mindfulness mean that I'm going to be slow? at doing it? No, not at all. No, no, no. No, it doesn't, it doesn't slow you down. In fact, um, look, I don't know whether it makes it any quicker, but my experience is that it just makes you calmer. Uh, I don't think so, no. No, 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 that's fine. Okay. Good question, though. Any other questions? Still really tough. The position. Good. You're saying the position for mindfulness in your house the position of mindfulness. Can you be lying on a bed? Okay. You're talking about sitting up straight. What, what I'm talking about, uh, posture, yep. I, that's in relation to meditation. Yep. Okay. Mindfulness, you can walk along. Okay. You can do so walking can do. mindfulness. You can, uh, um, we can be mindful in this room. Mm -hmm. If I'm totally concentrating on what I'm saying now to you, and I'm not worried about those people over there, I'm being very mindful mm -hmm. and in the present moment with you, okay? With, with the posture, though, for meditation, generally speaking, is to be in a straight back chair. However, I do know that there are people, and I often get them to meditation classes that have bad backs and all sorts of things, and we have to compensate for that. A lot of people ask me whether you can meditate in bed. Mm, yes, is the answer to that. You can, but you can also use it as an excuse. Um, I tell you what, if you suffer from insomnia, I found that meditation, going to bed, if I meditate here in the straight back chair in my pyjamas and then I get up and get straight into bed and I try and continue the meditation, concentrating on my breath, I'm asleep in no time. It's really helpful. Do you have any guided meditation that you have tapes or anything that you have done no. that we can follow? Uh, no. No, I don't. No, sorry. You've got a lovely voice. Oh, thank you. I, I, I do have one. I do have one, but um, it's, I haven't... Yeah, I don't, I don't sell them or anything like that. No, I don't. There yeah. Can I just add, there is a, a meditation tape that's um, app that's free yeah. that I use. Mm. Uh, what's it called? Smiling Minds is one. Smiling Minds. There's yeah. a number. Uh, there's there's so some for children them. and yeah. there's some for adults. Yeah. Uh, so you can look Find your own way and never let anybody tell you that you're doing it the wrong way because your way may not be your way and your way may not be your way. You'll get, you get people who teach meditation who say, this is the way you do it. And I can understand from one point of view, once you find the correct way, the way that suits you, stay with it. Don't chop and change too much. But don't let anybody else tell you that you're not a meditator unless you're doing it in a particular way. Well, I forgot to tell you about Peter's day yesterday and I had a, a phone call from Jenny, his daughter, to say that he'd had a terrible day but he still wanted to come and do this presentation and also thanks to Jenny down the back there for driving him and getting him to us. Um, thank you so much. It was so relaxing. I think 
if one thing we learned, we need to take time out for ourselves and to do that exercise. I mean, I could have fallen asleep down there. <laughs> so it is a lovely thing to do. Fall asleep but don't feel guilty. No, I don't. <laughs> yes. So thank you thank so you. much. Just a small thank gift from our Thanks, group. Colleen. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone.